So hello and welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from all around the world. I'm your host for today, Simon Hodgkins, and I'm delighted to be joined by Anna Husaf. So Anna is an author, a translator, a journalist, and since back in 2002, I believe, a full-time novelist. Um, so it's great that we've got Anna here. She's a published author who writes for everything from young readers through to adults and has published, I know, several uh, contemporary uh, crime novels, adventure novels, and Anna even dips into love stories. So we'll find out all about this in a moment. Um, I do want to mention that she's received major awards for her writing. And back in 2013, as an example, received the Children's Award uh, for Children's Books Island. And in for between 1985 and 2002, Anna was also a radio researcher and a television producer slash director with RTE. For, for our international uh, audience and people listening, RTE is the state broadcaster for Ireland, um, both television and radio. And occasionally, and from time to time, Anna would also broadcast on current affairs and, of course, literary issues. So you're very welcome to Vista Talks, Anna. Thank you very much, Simon. It's, it's our pleasure. So let's, let's move on. I've got a lot I want to ask you. I wanted to start off right at the beginning, and that's really with how did you get involved in writing and where did this interest or passion come from? Well, I was always interested in writing and, of course, reading, which is the first thing everybody who writes has to be able to read and want to read as well. I grew up in a family. I was lucky to grow up in a family where books were part of daily life. And so I tried a bit of writing in college, as a lot of people do. I tried a few things in my 20s and 30s, but I was also interested in journalism. I was interested and still am in, in activism or campaigning on issues that, you know, we need to make the world a, a better or safer place. For example, I'm, I'm still involved in climate campaigning um, and was involved in homelessness and housing. Um, so there was a lot of deciding what am I going to do? How can I earn a living as well? So I really started writing properly in my 40s and there are a lot of writers, in fact, who start much later than that. Um, so, you know, anybody listening who thinks, oh, I've always wanted to do that, but I'm now aged 50. Don't worry. There are plenty of people who start later in life and can be benefit from our experience later in life. So the way it happened was I had left my job of about 18 years in RTE, partly because my son was very young and the time schedules and all that were very difficult, rushing around the country making, making television programs. Um, and my, my husband had a very busy job as well. So I decided to leave. I spent a bit of time taking a step back and thinking, what will I do next? And in that time, it happened that a friend of mine, another Irish speaker, said we had a conversation about crime novels in Irish. And I said, oh, there aren't, there should be far more of them. There is only a handful. And she said to me, well, you should try writing one because she knew I was interested in writing. And she was, she's also a, a literary and, and, and academic uh, scholar herself, but she, she knew of my interest. So that's the way I thought I'll, I'll give it a try. And I did. And eventually it, it was published and people really liked it. And I decided to continue. Thank you, Anna, for sharing that. Um, and yes, after a, a long, uh, illustrious career with the uh, state broadcaster um, producing television to move into writing full time, it's, it's a big move. Um, but I wanted to ask you as well, because I know you've written books for, for lots of various groups and how challenging you found it to adjust for, say, these varied groups and audiences and genres, and also the age ranges, because you, you've kind of gone across a different age range, whereas a lot of authors maybe write for one or two specific audience types or niches. Your books seem to be quite varied, uh, if I can say so. Yes, the, the first book I wrote was a crime novel for fluent readers, adult readers of Irish. So a couple of hundred pages and, you know, challenging or demanding vocabulary as anybody, any fluent reader in any language um, would, would expect. And obviously that had a whole lot of challenges of its own, um, as have the subsequent crime novels of similar kind I've written. 
Um, but, you know, because there's always kind of what words, how much variety of language, how much to kind of move on with the story or kind of get deeper into the sort of the layers of character and, and description and so on. Then I decided to, the second book I wrote, my son was aged about 12 at the time, and I decided I wanted to write a shorter book, partly because of the time it takes to write, and because I wanted to try a different, see how, how a different kind of book would go. And so I decided to write an adventure sort of mystery, and each of the books of that genre for age 10 to 14 or so that, I, that I've written um, involve a screen game, you know, like a PlayStation game or, or similar, um, where there's a mystery inside the game, but and it's a new game that happens to be being trialed by this group of three, three young friends uh, who have an uncle who works in developing games. And, and in the course of this, some mystery happens in the game, but that spills over or has an effect on dangers and mystery that happens in their own real lives. Of course, screen games, playing games is part of real life for, for nearly all teenagers. Um, so I, I, I was inspired to write that because my, my son, of course, played these games and I could see him and I could see the world he was involved in with that. But immediately I, the challenge I had was that in Irish, as the second language for, for most children who would read it, for, for, for some children would be their first language, their vocabulary and their language ability could be much more limited than their understanding of the world and of reading. They might be reading books hundreds of pages long in English, and but not so used to reading much in Irish. So I had to make the story as interesting as they needed and as exciting for their age group but keep the language simpler. And that is quite a challenge. Um, I took on a third challenge with another kind of book some years ago, which is uh, the love story I've, I've written, which is aimed at adult learners of Irish. And, and there, of course, I had to decide, well, what level of learners? Is this people who have only a very, you know, broken knowledge of Irish or very simple knowledge of Irish, let's say, or people who are, close to being fluent. So I had to, to pitch the language again and keep it consistent throughout. And if I used words that I thought were maybe a bit difficult, uh, to use them several times so that if people took the trouble of looking up that word or, you know, finding it in a list uh, of words for the story, that they'd get the benefit of that further on. So it's, it's interesting. Well, thank you, Anna. And uh, I mean, there's lots to unpack there, but it, it's sort of um, it's making me think about the different layers, because obviously you think about, well, do people understand the language and how fluent are they? But within that, you've got this almost sliding scale of understanding and fluency, haven't you? And that's 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 relevant to the different audience types and where you pitch a book at or how you tell a story to a particular type of person uh, or audience type, I should say. Um, but you've also got to really think about those key criteria uh, when you're pitching the book uh, to make sure that it's well received, well read and, of course, understood. Well, um, indeed. And, and also, of course, in English as a worldwide language, yeah. you know, read by hundreds of millions of people or more, the, the authors also have to think of the pitch of language they're using because some of the the most popular bestseller books are written in simpler language normally than than the mo very literary demanding style of writing now there are literary novels which are written in in simple quite quite you know very accessible uh, english uh, at at all at many levels too but it is a choice that authors make however with a minority and language that's struggling in terms of 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 numbers of speakers and readers and um, those questions are kind of multiplied no absolutely 100 percent. and look we've, we've mentioned a, a few different genres there a few different age ranges and some of those sort of challenges that you had and i must say just as a quick observation you certainly didn't start and <laughs> and start lightly you really jumped into some really interesting with the, the sort of different types of books that you wrote earlier on so before we go any further, could I ask you to maybe share with our audience the books that you've written 
and maybe share a little bit of, bit of information about each one and, and the differences and what made you write each particular book. Yes, thank you. Well, the, 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 the first type, if you like, of genre are uh, crime novels. So the classic kind of whodunit, uh, a, a murder happens, something, you know, odd or different or mysterious about it. An investigation takes place um, and, and there's a mystery and, you know, uh, uh, we're led off in various directions and, and eventually there's a resolution. So, uh, but within that, of course, there are all kinds of ways these kinds of books are written. So uh, I've written three of them. So I've had three published and I'm in the course of writing uh, a fourth. And um, I'll show you, this is, this is the second one in Irish. Um, which means uh, a deadly blow. Um, and this is set on, uh, as the first one was, on uh, by the Atlantic coast in the southwest of Ireland, uh, a place called the Beira Peninsula, which has wonderful mountains and lots of little uh, harbours and inlets and beaches and a, 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 a very strong sense of community. I mean, it's quite a big uh, peninsula, uh, but, you know, there are very long established kind of communities there and also incomers and the, the people at the heart of the story, the, the, the two people investigating that I sort of focus on, one of them is a former journalist called Aoife, and she has, um, uh, she and her family moved from Dublin to Beira. Uh, some years before and set up a kind of holiday and guided walking uh, tours uh, uh, business. And the murder happens among a group of a group of strangers, the classic thing, bring together a group of strangers and something happens. Um, and one of them is found uh, is found dead. And and we realize it's murder. And did this happen? Is it somebody in the group? Is it somebody else locally who had some connection? Uh, does it have to do with issues in the local area or with something much further away that has kind of been brought to this, this place? So then the third book, Skull of Friesoin, which is the shadow of the jail or the prison, is set in Kilmainham, the same area uh, as Vistatech um, is, of course, in, in Dublin. And I, I live up the road from, from Vistatech. And I decided after setting two crime novels in Beira that um, I wanted to set uh, a story in this area because it's a very historic area, of course. It has Kilmainham Jail, uh, where major events of Irish history took place and is a museum today. It also has um, the, the War Memorial Gardens. It has the oldest um, graveyard in Dublin, in Bullies Acre, uh, on the grounds of the um, Royal Hospital, uh, which is now the Museum of Modern Art. But there are so many interesting places in the area. And the, the people, the community is a mix of, again, long established Dubliners and kind of newer people such as myself. I'm a Dubliner, but I didn't grow up in the area. Um, and a lot of floating people, if you like, a lot of, of people whose backgrounds are in other countries. Um, so again, that allows for a lot of variety. Um, and the atmosphere, I decided to start this story in the jail, that the murder would happen in the jail. And I had to figure out how could this happen today when it's a museum? And I decided on a on a, a launch of a of a of a launch event of a of a of an, a special exhibition. And but the murder happens in one of the old cells, uh, and of course it has a kind of a locked a locked room uh, element to it. Um, so they're the the novels for adults so far. Well, um, Anna, Anna, before you say anything, yes. I mean, I'm hooked. I'm already hooked uh, because. <laughs> You mentioned Kilmainham, and of course, Vistatech's global headquarters are in Kilmainham, yes. uh, in Dublin, Ireland. Although there's, you know, there's many, many people and many, many teams, departments, and offices all over the world. But Kilmainham is is very dear. And as you mentioned, you think about Kilmainham Jail and the Irish history that took place there. And if you think about, uh, you mentioned the. Uh, uh, you know, there's that contrasted opposite that building, I know, is the Irish Museum of Modern Art. So it's just incredible that you get these cultures and history all sort of merged together in one area. And your two crime novels were both based on the west, co well, southwest coast of Ireland. And, of course, 
our international listeners may or may not have heard about the the wild atlantic way at this part which has been a huge global advertising campaign for tourism for ireland obviously pre-pandemic i suppose was was more um more relevant but a lot of people now are traveling to the west of ireland to experience that atlantic way and it's it's just it's really resonating because your two crime novels are sort of set in that southwest corner of Ireland. Uh, so, and, and I should I should also mention that one of my crime novels, I wrote a version of it in English, a, a translation or a version, that's another interesting question oh. about language. And you'll see that it's not my surname uh, on, or my, not the surname I'm, I, I've had uh, all my life um, on the cover, but a surname, I, a name I took for the book and I'll could explain a bit more about that in a minute. But, um, this is a version of the novel uh, Buila Marafach, uh, set in the, on the Beira Peninsula, and it was published um, some years ago. So for people who would like to read uh, one of my books, at least um, in English, uh, this is uh, still available and it's available in, in libraries. And I believe it's available in the United States as well as in, in Ireland, Britain. Um, so, um, so then on to the uh, books for young readers. And again, I'll go to the second one, um, the first one, well, I'll, I'll throw up the first first, they all have red covers. Uh, Vortex is the first one, uh, and it's about a game where, in this case, the one of the players gets sucked into the game, so there's a kind of an element of, of, of magic in this, and ha his friends uh, have to rescue him out of the game, and the game happens in several different cities, so they're in London and Paris and Rome and New York. Uh, and uh, so that's that was quite a lot of fun. This one, Hong, um, involves China because I have I have to confess I've never been to China, but I decided to set part of the novel in China because I was thinking about the fact that, of course, China is such a, such a global power and influence and part of all our lives through products and through through every second thing we buy um, so um, and of course it's ancient culture along with that um, so I decided something would happen in a game that's set in a city in China but it's been played in Ireland and it involves a mystery about two Chinese young Chinese people who are in Ireland but have got sucked into a uh, apparently dangerous business, possibly illegal, and that they didn't want to be sucked into. And and so this, this it involves, in other words, current issues. And I brought in bits and pieces I learned about Chinese culture. And at the same time, it's set in Ireland and accessible to young uh, Irish people. And the third one uh, in this series, um, Saru, which means overcoming or like overcoming a challenge or doing the best you can and this is uh, this involves you can see they're looking at a watch it involves a game played on a smartwatch and this was published uh, in 2017 and at the time I was surprised to find in a classroom where I talked to to the pupils that two or three pupils already at that time had smartwatches and of course now they're all over the place um but the the, the, the story involves um, saving the world. I thought, let's go for the, let's go for a big theme here. And interestingly, the first, the first level of the game, I decided, this was in 2016, 17, involves a pandemic. And perhaps this is my, I think this is my journalistic background because I'm always watching, reading news stories and following what's going on. And I thought, well, Sounds like this could happen someday. Um, so I brought in uh, issues about a pandemic, but my biggest interest was bringing in um, the climate crisis and, and also plastic pollution uh, of the oceans. And so each level of the game involves choices about saving the world, but then in the town by the sea in Ireland of which these young characters live, they, they're hit by a terrible storm, you know, there are issues of, of, of pollution. They, so again, I bring the themes in the game and in our real outside world uh, together. And you might be saying, well, do 12 year olds really understand these issues? 
And the way I was able to be confident that they do was not only from talking to my son, who is now grown up, however, but, but because when I'm writing a draft of a novel, the practice I have is to give a full draft to, for adults, maybe to four or five or six people to read, to get their feedback. For children, I've, and young, young teens, as I say, I have, for each of the books, I've gone to a school or two schools, you know, maybe a school I have a connection with, got a class or two classes to read the draft. I've given them questions about what they understand, what they find good, what they don't like, any ideas they have. And I get great feedback from that. And, and they told me, oh yes, we do know about these, these uh, questions and we are worried and we are interested. Um, so, um, so, so that's what that story is about. So now one more novel to show you. Um, this is the love story. Now this is this, you can see with this one that the, well, the light is on it, but the, the, the typeface is quite large. And so it's, it's, as I said, this is aimed at adults who are, or college students uh, who are learning Irish and who wouldn't be confident reading, a, you know, a book like, here's, you know, the kind of typeface for Willem Arafach. And uh, it's, you know, it's about a hundred pages um, in the case of Kupla Fuckel. And the love story, the idea I had was to set it in a conversation class for adult learners so that the context of actually learning the language is part of the story but there's a love triangle where the teacher there seems to be something mysterious about him but he he there's a one of the people in the class she's interested in him she's attracted by him but somebody else comes into the class who apparently knows him from from a previous something that happened previously between them so there's this kind of love triangle that takes place in the course of the story so it was quite good fun um, and again because of I suppose my journalistic background I brought a couple of contemporary issues to do with identity and sexuality into the story as well uh, so it's a, I describe it as a quirky love story rather than a traditional sort of heart-throbbing uh, tale. Well thank you Anna I mean my my mind is, is gone to lots of different places there. Thank you for taking us through the books that you've written so far. And it is it is true testament and, and congratulations on such a, a varied variety of genres and audience types. And I was fascinated when you mentioned things like just, just you know, things that we all know about, but the typeface and how important that can be to a reader. Uh, and also, I think setting the the language learning book or the love story in the language learning setting is really clever and smart, and I'm sure that's that's well received. Uh, but also, then you talk about sort of the detective, uh, you know, crime murder uh, type stories where they're a bit more intense and they've got a very particular genre. Um, and of course, the the market research that you did with the the the, the school children. Uh, I mean that's real time feedback. That's that's excellent, you know. Um, so you, you mm. kind of gauge that in real time from the the students with what they thought of the draft, you know. Um, so listen, thank you very much indeed for for sharing the books with us here today. Uh, and of course, if people want to get hold of them, I'm sure they can get them in the, from their uh, usual online. If they're international, I'm sure they can find some of them online, and in particular the English uh, version one that you mentioned as well. That was wrote under Anna Sweeney, if I if I got that type. If That's that correct. Right. Yes, yeah. yes, that um, that can also be found online, and and as can, of course, as 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 um, everyone in Vistatech knows, information about about Irish and the sort of the status of Irish, the struggles of Irish as a as a minority yeah. language, the achievements, yeah. uh, and the very long literary and and spoken history uh, of Irish uh, too. Um, so so um, I'm sure people. Can no, follow absolutely. Up on all of this. It, it's a really important topic. I know uh, a little while ago, uh, Vistatech took part in the, sorry, the Year of Indigenous Languages, uh, where it was supporting Indigenous languages throughout the world, and particularly languages that were uh, unfortunately uh, waning or on the way out, um, and supporting the Irish language both within Ireland uh, nationally and, of course, globally. 
Uh, we we've we speak to many people who have a passion for uh, the Irish language, but you know that it's not just Ireland and Irish people. It's people from whatever country or whatever culture they come from. They, there's a passion, and typically we find that the younger children sometimes are. Uh, it's sort of uh, mandated that they learn it because in Ireland, for example, schools uh, Irish is taught uh, as well as English. Whereas in some countries and some cultures, their their national language maybe isn't taught uh, as much anymore. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're big fans of, of course, of course, why wouldn't we be of promoting the use of language and also uh, working with various languages around the world. Um, we, we would often work at 150 plus languages would be very common to Vista Tech, um, uh, Irish and, and English, of course, being, being two of those. But I did want to ask you, because when we talk about writers and the Irish language, I, we, we've had on this podcast show uh, a lady called Margaret Keller, who I know is known to you, and she wrote a wonderful uh, true uh, story uh, about uh, the Mam Trasner murders. And we've had a number of people who've wrote books on uh, the podcast. And I, I wanted to ask you about the type of books that you like writing the most, because you've got a number of genres. So do you, you know, when you, when you look back and you think, well, I, I wrote this one about crime and I wrote this one about love. And is there any particular type that you like writing or are you still looking at new genres? Well, I, there are other genres I would consider, but, and perhaps in Irish, there are more writers who do cross several genres. There are, I can think of a number of writers offhand who, 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 who've done that. Um, so perhaps because there are a lot, we know we're very aware of the kind of gaps in, in the kind of supply of, 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 of uh, book. So the, the classic thing, of course, is to write the kind of book that you'd like to read, or in the case of the book, when I started writing for young teens, I thought, you know, this is the kind of book my son would like to read. He was already giving up reading books in Irish because the time, the supply for teenagers, the kind of choices wasn't very good. Now it has, it has improved, but of course there's massive room for improvement still. Um, so I think I like each of the genres I've written, but because to write a, a crime novel or any novel that is a couple of hundred pages and, you know, gets well into, you know, several characters and, and interleaved stories and so on, it can take up to a year's full-time work. So that's, that's a lot of sitting, thinking about the next sentence and rewriting and rewriting again and again. So, it's worked well for me to alternate so that because while I'm I see myself as a full time writer, I actually do spend some of my time doing various other things related often, but to, to earn some more money, because, of course, the question of how writers earn money uh, in any language uh, for most writers is is always a, a, a live question. But I would say that rather than what's the kind or the genre of writing that I like the most, the stage of writing that I like the most is when I have written the first full draft and I'm going back over it and taking a step back from it because writing the first draft and I do it as a kind of I rewrite a chapter, I go back and rewrite it, I go a few steps forward to maybe chapter three, back again maybe rewrite that and proceed like that, because then I feel that each stage I'm reaching, I have a better foundation, I have a stronger foundation, and I can rely on what's come before. Um, but it's slow. One sentence after another is the only way to write anything. Um, and well, in my experience. Um, and so when it at least the whole, the basis of it is there. And I know that it has a beginning, middle and end. And then I can take a step back and I can give it to other people to read. And that first draft, first full draft, of course, has had a lot of rewriting within it, as I say. Then, then I can really see how much it improves, or I hope I can see it, um, as, I'm, as I'm rewriting and I can see where it's lacking, you know, where it needs a bit more substance in one place and take some of the detail out in another place and and so that that's the the easier and perhaps the most pleasurable part but um but you have to like you have to like all of us really to stick at it 
No, that that's great. That's a great answer because it's the process. It's the love of the process. It's the post first draft and being able to craft the story and hopefully, as you say, iterate and improve on the story uh, over time. So um, just a quick side question. Do you have a set time that you write each day when you're writing or is it as the moment takes you or is it first thing in the morning, last thing at night or how does that work for you? Well, it's not a set time, but it's more that I get into a phase of writing. So there are periods when I would write every day or four days a week at least. Uh, and then I could write all day. You know, I might, I'm not very good at early mornings. Um, so I mightn't start at nine or 10 o'clock. Um, but then I could go, you know, through the day um, once I get going. But then there are periods when I'm doing other things. And also, of course, as a lot of writers would say, it's very easy to allow other things to take first place. You know, oh, I need to write these emails and, oh, you know, I'm on the committee for this and I have to write up their minutes or I'm, you know, I, I have to do an interview for, for Vista Tech, um, for Vista Talks <laughs> or whatever it might be. Um, so, so discipline is always a challenge, uh, but I just tell myself, well, I've done it before, so, right. you know, I will do it again. And having deadlines, deadlines that are a bit flexible and that the publisher understands if other things came first for a while, but at the same time, having deadlines is essential to get it done. Very good, very good. And um, are there any authors in particular that you really enjoy or that you, that you look to, that you, that you enjoy their writing? Well, I read a wide range of books, and I mentioned I've been in a book club for for over thirty years, wow. in fact, with a group of friends. And um, so, and we read we read you know everything from okay. literary novels to history to politics to to um, other you know all biographies, all sorts, travel writing, philosophy. Um, so I would have that kind of range. So and read in in both languages too. It, on crime, one of my favourite authors is Donna Leone, who writes a crime novel set in Venice. And of course, it's a great way of visiting the wonderful city of Venice uh, virtually. Um, and, and also, I like the fact that her, her detective, uh, Brunetti, Commissario Guido Brunetti, is not this stereotype, uh, you know, alienated lonely man who you know is semi-alcoholic and you know doesn't get on with anybody else he is a family man his family comes into the story he is pretty you know well adjusted and interested in other things besides his work um and and I've always felt you know I I don't I haven't used those stereotypes myself and I mean some of them are wonderful of course there are great great detectives in that uh, in that style but uh, then I suppose I would say in, in English, I would, you know, there are classics that I love, like Jane Eyre uh, was, was my favourite novel as a teenager. And when I went back much later on as, a no, as an adult, I still went, oh, oh, even though I can see and I read the, the novel that is the story of, of Mrs. Rochester and, and, you know, from her point of view, um, uh, whose title now I've, I've, I've forgotten this moment, but it's a wonderful book. Um, Jane Austen, I like. Again, that's a very different style. Uh, but I read contemporary, a lot of contemporary novels and travel writing. Uh, and, and I read, as I say, uh, Irish authors, poetry occasionally, short stories occasionally. So um, I'm afraid my list would be, would be too long to, uh, to give <laughs> here. That's that's lovely. Uh, you mentioned Jane Eyre, and you took me straight back to the classroom uh, and and learning Jane Eyre uh, as part of my English education, and also going to see it in theatre and uh, realizing just how wonderful the writing was when you see it on stage, which was also great. But um, there's something very special about the writing. There is, and actually, the the title of the novel it's it's I think it's across the Sargasso Sea, or it involves the Sargasso Sea anyway, uh, and the real Mrs. Rochester who who came, uh, who was from a Caribbean uh, island, and of course the whole issues of slavery and 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 mixed communities and so on comes into it, and it's I'd recommend it to anybody who hasn't read it, but I also recommend Jane Eyre to anybody who'd yes. like to go back to it. Excellent, excellent. 
because uh, when you mentioned uh, mysteries and, and detectives and, and murders at the start, my, my immediate mind goes to, you know, the Sherlock Holmes and the um, Agatha Christie's and the Poirot's and the, you know, um, did you have that attraction to it or was it, did you come to it purely through the, the literary sense? I, oh yes, I had that attraction. I mean, I had read Agatha Christie as a teenager and, yeah. and, and then, and then picked up again in my twenties. My husband was a great reader of uh, crime, crime novels uh, too, and as, and lots of other novels. Um, but I remember one of the authors who really made me interested as an adult is um, Sarah Peretsky, who writes a crime novel set in Chicago. And her protagonist, V.I. Warshawski, uh, is, a, is a woman, uh, you know, private detective. Uh, and what she does is she brings in environmental issues and corruption and kind of really paints a life of Chicago, a place I've never been. But um, so I, one of the things I really like about crime novels is their sense of place. So I mentioned Venice, you know, there are crime novels set almost anywhere you go nowadays but but in there are also crime novels set in all kinds of eras so for example uh, cj sansom writes a crime novel set in tudor england uh, so he's the kind of crime novels to hillary mantel's novels of thomas cromwell and um, he has they're very very good and they really gives and he's a historian i believe uh, so he he gives a sense of 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 the time and and the awful politics and violence of the time uh, another co other completely different style is um, peter tremaine who writes crime novels set in 7th century ireland uh, and the, the the detective is called Sister Fidelma. She is both a nun and and a lawyer in the Gaelic Brehon system of Brehon the Brehon laws. And Peter Tremaine, uh, that's a that's his uh, his name for the novels. But he's Peter Beresford Ellis is himself a historian and expert on that period. So. You know, you can get a lot more as well as your mystery and your suspense and your your drama of life and death, which is, of course, what what draws people to to, to crime novels. Um, and I could, you know, I could go on with lots of other uh, examples of 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 styles and 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 eras. Yeah, everything from Tudor to going back. Did you say sixth or seventh century Ireland? Seventh century Ireland, yes. And as I say, you could. My habit now, if well, pre pandemic. Going on holiday somewhere abroad, I might say, I'm going to read a novel set in this place. Right. And, you know, it's not, it may not be a crime novel, of course, but but I heard, for example, in Germany, there are something like 700 members of the, the Professional Crime Writers Association. So because novels set in, you know, each area, each city, each town is such a such a, a draw for for readers and right. and uh, again you know we can find them everywhere they're not all of the same quality of course wherever you you read but you can find a crime novel to suit the style you like I think anyway. it's fast it's fascinating Anna and you know you've taken me to seventh century island in one breath and then a little while ago you were talking about how back in 2016 you were writing about you know diversity and inclusion and you know, uh, eco type, uh, you know, plastic Prices. pollution, etc. You know, and the pandemic. <laughs> so, it's a it's a it's a whirlwind uh, um, discussion. And I wanted to ask you though a really important thing, one that's close to our heart, is the use of the Irish language. And obviously, in your writing and your and, and be keen to understand and maybe tease out a little bit your views on the importance of publishing in Irish. Yes, well, as 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 most people watching and listening will will know, Irish is the native language of Ireland. Well, English has obviously been a native language for a couple of hundred years as well. But um, so Irish goes back at least it's thought at least two thousand years and is is the oldest uh, written language in Northern Europe that's still spoken. Um, and I grew up speaking Irish. I grew up speaking Irish in Dublin, so that I like, you know, many, many other uh, families, but a small minority at the same time. Um, and so I, I, I've been speaking Irish and English all my, both Irish and English all, all my life, really. Uh, Irish from a little bit earlier than English, but, but, but both. 
Um, and so sometimes I think people have asked me, well, why would you write in Irish if your readership is going to be so much more limited than in English? And well, my answer to that is that, that there are thousands and thousands of people writing in English already. So the, the, the choice available is, is enormous. Whereas I can do something that not so many people are doing. And I know from my experience of, of having novels published in Irish that there are uh, you know, at least a few thousand people who, who, who want to read them. Um, and so that that is 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 one of the things I suppose that that drives me. I suppose more personally, I feel more more interested. I suppose in the way Irish works, and I suppose because there's less, there are far fewer contemporary novels written in Irish than in English. It feels fresher. It's 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 more difficult in English. When I wrote the the version of of, of one of my novels in English. I found it was more difficult to sound as if I was saying something new and to, you know, the, the words and the, the, the ideas in them felt more kind of worn out. So, so that is more of a challenge, I think, in English. Um, so, so, you know, I love the, the, the sounds and the, the rhythms of Irish and the way, the way Irish, while it was a language that was marginalised and, and pushed down, I suppose, for, for, for very much so, for a couple of hundred years and associated with, with poverty and, 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 and so on, um, that it, since the early 20th century, it has been enriched and developed to be fully flexible, able to deal with everything in, 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 in modern life. Um, in our in our lives today, and so that's a very enjoyable part of it as well. So writing crime fiction, for example, people will say, well, they're not as used to terms to do with forensics, and you know the the, the, the kind of the science of, of 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 forensics, and so how to kind of tell that story using real terms that that are the right terms, but at the same time that are accessible to readers who might be used to them is 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 interesting uh, as well so um yeah i i i i want to be able to read lively contemporary well-written books uh, in irish as well as reading those sorts of books in english and um i'm i'm very glad it's 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 worked out for me that that i've been able to write uh, at least a few of them and there are there are many other there are about a hundred books a year published in irish of which about half would be for children and young people and obviously not all 100 every year are, are great books, but, but a lot of them are, are good and a lot of them are very well produced as well as being well written. Well, that's, that's wonderful. And thank goodness that you are, Anna. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to just, I mean, I mentioned Margaret Kelleher earlier and the Mam Trasner murders, uh, but I also wanted to mention that back on episode nine, I remember talking to Sinead McKay, who's the director of Literature Ireland, and back in 94, I think it was, um, they sort of got established as this Literature Island organization. And they fund, I know, a lot of translation of, at the time, it was about 2,000 works of Irish literature into 56 odd languages worldwide. And obviously, they were trying to promote or continue to promote Irish writers and writing internationally through they have everything from translation grant programs to literature type events. But I know I wanted to ask you in particular about your own experience, because I know you've translated books into Irish and, and possibly vice versa. So how, how easy or challenging have you found that process from a writer's perspective? Well, I, I, it's very interesting uh, to, to translate and because I'm, I'm interested in language itself and because I said I've both Irish and English have been have been part of my life for for since I was a small child, um, and I suppose as far as translating from Irish outwards uh, goes, um, my own my main experience was with my own novel uh, that became Deadly Intent. Uh, uh, by Anna Sweeney, this imposter. Uh, with with uh, they decided that they wanted the publisher wanted my wanted uh, to be able to promote the book was their plan at the time anyway in Britain and the United States as well as in Ireland, and they said well because my surname actually isn't an Irish surname, um, it would be better to have an Irish surname. So I went back. My mother's surname was Doherty. 
uh, and we thought that might be a bit difficult in terms of spelling and pronunciation for non-Irish people. Uh, so I went back to my great-grandmother in Donegal, whose surname was Sweeney, and called myself. She was Annabella Sweeney, so I became Anna Sweeney. But on the translation, when I was working on the translation first, it felt like, and I got a couple of people to read the first few chapters I tried to, I tried to write in English. They said, mm, it reads like Irish written in English, a bit like, you know, the kind of style of language that that Jonathan Miller, uh, John, that, that Singh invented in the early 20th century for his plays that he created, uh, this style really. Um, you know, it, it didn't sound like like English, like today's English, I think. And so, so then what I did was, instead of going sentence by sentence, I went back and I looked at the page and I said, now what's happening here? What's the atmosphere here? What's the character? And I, I rewrote. So I, I start as if I was writing from scratch. And it was, you know, I followed the story, um, about 95% of the story, I would say, because another interesting thing happened, which was I decided mm, that bit of the story, I wasn't all that happy with it. Now, maybe I could change it because, after all, I'm the author as well as the, the translator. Uh, so I can um, I can decide if I want to change some details here and there. But I would say the the I heard a term just in the last few days that instead of saying a translator, you could say a trans creator. And I think literary translations of any kind, there is a creative, a significant creative element in it. And the books I've translated from English have mainly been for children. And um, a couple of them were Darling Kindersley, a book, the, the great book of music, a great book of, of, of art, uh, and um, a big book, the big book of art. Um, and there it's how to say this in another language in just as simple a way, but just as accurate a way as it was said. And in that case, I had to actually fit the words into particular spaces on the page. So that was quite uh, a job. But I had had experience of translating cartoons from English to Irish, um, television cartoons, um, which uh, so the the script had to had to match, you know, for the for the voiceover dubbing, it had to match the exact number of seconds uh, and and the sort of the even the shape of the mouth of the characters of the cartoon characters. So that did help me. Um, so it is, it's a whole, it's a whole process by itself. And I have huge respect for the, you know, some of the, I, I, some of the Tintin books, the um, Asterix books have been translated into to Irish in recent years, as into at least 100, maybe 120 languages by now. Um, and, and they're a great example of both the joys and the challenges of, of, of translation, I think. Oh, you're, you're spot on, Anna. So thank you very much indeed for that insight. Um, the the trans creator or, or trans creation, as as uh, Vistatech would talk a lot about these days, it's such a it's such a hot area because, you know, I suppose going back a number of years, it was all about translation, but more and more now out, outside of the literary world. Now I'm talking more in terms of brands and communicating messages, mm -hmm. the trans creation of audio, written and video. Uh, and getting it to to work is uh, exceptionally important. Um, and having really world class trans creators working on content for you is it's becoming critical uh, for a lot of these brands. And it's just interesting to hear you say that in terms of your own experience. And you mentioned like fitting the words of a different language onto a page, or uh, and you know we we even see that today. There's huge discussion at the moment, and I, I want to come on to your own television career, uh, just as we come towards the end of our discussion here today. But there are some huge Netflix uh, programs like the popular one at the moment at the time of recording is Squid Game. And there's a, there's a huge discussion taking place about the, the, the dubbing, the subtitling, the different languages and how that a, a non-English speaking production can become their biggest international global success. So it's, it's very interesting to, to hear you raise those points. 
Um, Indeed. And, and of course, a lot of children's books in Irish have been translated out to other languages yes. and 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 uh, and some some uh, books for some one of the classics of, of Irish language writing in the 20th century, Crane Aquila, which is a, a, a story set in a graveyard amongst people who died. But this community, they're all still having the same arguments and and feuds as they had above ground and wondering when the next person who dies uh, arrives in the in the graveyard they're waiting for the news of 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 what's been happening uh, and that's in in quite a number of languages uh, now uh, in in recent years uh, so yes they they are fascinating questions and as you say in in marketing and and branding it must be exactly the same the yeah. same challenges and I suppose because we've all been on various lockdowns, depending on which part of the world that you've been in, that level of escapism, you know, by going on holiday and traveling the world maybe hasn't been there for a lot of people that it may have been in the past. And, you know, whether it's a written word or listening to audio books or whether it's watching a movie instead of going to the theater, you know, watching it at home, that escapism, the storytelling has become really, really important to people, you know, and good storytelling the world over is, is such an important uh, element, not just for educational purposes, but for escapism um, and for, for in personal enjoyment, you know, as, as a species. And well, I think storytelling is 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 fundamental to human beings, really, because we we it's the way we make sense of the world, and and not only for escapism, though escapism is really important to us as human beings too, in order to get away from what's in our heads uh, maybe too much of the time but in terms of political and and you know cri crisis issues how the climate crisis is told as a story what we understand about it actually has a huge influence on the way we react to it and you know we know in societies where there's a very divided politics the way the state of the world is told can be a completely different story and that can determine people's decisions. So storytelling is, is so fundamental at, at, at all levels in our relationships with each other. It's, 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 it's part of it. So doing it in fiction is just another version of what we're doing all day, every day, really, in our lives. I couldn't agree more, Anna. And so that, that brings me on to sort of the, the last type of questions that I want to put to you as we... we, we come to the end of our time here today but I know uh, before you started writing full-time and I mentioned this right at the top of our conversation you spent quite a number of years working for RTE and um, you know working for a you know a very large national television station producer program producer do you see any any similarities in sort of television and radio writing when it comes to sort of storytelling and you know writing books and did, did do you find that there's a lot of crossover from your previous career or was it completely something different that you wanted to get into i'm just interested in that sort of parallel between your pre-author days if i can call them that uh, in television and how that sort of spills into or mixes with uh, the author that, that we know today well, there are some some there are some things I learned from 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 many years working in. I worked in radio on daily po radio programs and current affairs and what we call features, which is you know about lifestyle and 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 community life and sometimes you know community conflicts and and uh, but I could be doing you know I worked on programs. Uh, I might be, you know, preparing a brief on the latest episode of, 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 of struggles and conflict in the Middle East to, you know, I made programmes in television about mental health struggles of individuals or, you know, the changing nature of tourism in a local area and how the kind of planning conflicts that might arise from that and all, you know, all sorts of, of stories. So what I'd learned that I've taken with me, I think, one is there's always a beginning, middle and end to the way you tell a story, whether it's a five minute radio interview or a 300 page novel. Um, but you have to choose how to tell it and how to make it accessible and how to judge what people already know and what will keep their interest. Every story has characters, people or for children, perhaps, or other kinds of stories, animals or spirits or whatever it might be. Um, every story has place. 
and every story has meaning. You know, what meaning are we taking from these events? So that's what we sometimes call the theme in, 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 in fiction. And, you know, what is this really about? And in crime fiction, for example, the meaning can be about, you know, as I say, the nature of, of, of good and evil or one person, one person versus society or whether law and order really works or, you know, there are lots of different ways or it could be a satire on law and order or on the state. Um, on the state's authority. So there are some of the things I took with me, but also when I worked in television as a, as a producer, particularly, we were making programs that we were filming in people's communities, in people's homes. So I was actually inside a lot of people's homes that wouldn't happen just in my, in my social and family life. And, you know, that was a, that was a privilege. And, and, and I got talking to people who had gone through a lot of difficulties in their lives or had particularly interesting things to say. Or... So I feel I draw on that because what I'm doing is imagining the lives of people that I'm now, instead of going into somebody's home that I didn't know and finding out about it, I'm now creating that and imagining that and, and making it sort of seem, seem real and vivid in the readers' uh, minds. Um, and that brings me just to a point about imagination that that I think you know people sometimes say oh writers have a great imagination and we certainly do have to be able to use our imagination which is being able to put ourselves in other people's shoes but actually I think that's another fundamental human uh, value and and trait of importance because that means we can try we never succeed entirely, but we can try to understand each other. And actually the biggest, the most dangerous people in our world, I think, are people who lack imagination because they're prepared to inflict violence and damage and danger on other people because it doesn't matter to them what happens to other people. So on that level, or maybe they decide, maybe they can imagine it and they don't care. But, but to me, learning to be some, somewhat as much as we can in each other's minds and, and learn from each other's experiences is fundamental to our need to live together as, as human beings. Uh, so so that, that's also part of the power of fiction. Very powerful answer, Anna. Thank you. Uh, how that sort of imagine, uh, imagination uh, helps, doesn't it, with empathy and uh, the understanding of, of, of uh, each other. Uh, regardless of where we come from so that that's a that's a wonderful answer um I don't know how to ask you the next thing because from what you've described I, I get the impression that you're fairly busy when it comes to the writing side of things but I was going to ask you when you're not writing what what other hobbies or interests are you involved in well I I have a lot of other interests <laughs> so I do spend my time juggling um, uh, different different interests, but yes, I love gardening and walking and meeting friends and really interested in history and music and archaeology, art and so on. Um, and uh, so so I have I have a lot of a lot of interests. Um, I I could mention maybe at this point that that my my husband of, of thirty years, uh, my beloved husband, died less than two years ago. Um, of cancer and and therefore I'm kind of uh, his name was Simon Brooke and he himself had huge numbers of interests and was a great reader and was also involved and in, he was involved in in social housing all his life and trying to make other people's lives uh, better uh, too um, and and we shared lots of interests in, in in reading and other things but so I'm I'm now you know beginning to beginning to learn uh, how to to live my interests, I suppose, uh, as, a, as, a, as a single person. Um, luckily, I suppose, at least I had always had interests separate from him, but it's a huge, it's a huge and very difficult um, transition to make. And the, the pandemic uh, didn't, didn't help, but certainly added to the, to the isolations as it did for, for a great many other people. Well, thank you for being so, so open. And of course, our condolences and, uh, it's a, it's a long time um, when you look back, and of course the pandemic, it wasn't good for 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 anybody. Uh, I, I don't think, and uh, for some people it wasn't it wasn't great time. And there was an awful lot of isolation, 
uh, for people around the world. I know even a lot of our own uh, people in our organization around the world when particular cities and countries were getting hit and different ways were hitting at different times. And back in the early days when maybe we weren't as uh, up to speed on the impact that it was going to have and how serious this, this was going to be as we watched it move around the world, it's been a very challenging time. So um, thank you for being so open. And, and uh, it's, uh, it, it just reminds us, doesn't it, how important and how fragile life is and Indeed. how we have to all work on things that we enjoy ultimately. Uh, and make exactly. The most and of yes. Yeah. And, and also to, to, to return to the, what we've been talking about, I suppose, books are great companions and, and, and escapes. Uh, for us but but we we need each other as people and and yeah. um, I think yeah. that, that, that we've certainly all had had a, a lesson on that and I think anybody who's had a difficult time personally for other reasons perhaps the, the pandemic was was extra difficult yeah. as well no I know well, well made the point well made Anna so look is there anything else that you would like to share with us I feel like we've covered an awful lot there Anna and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to discuss some of these topics with you and to hear all about the wonderful uh, books and the career that, that you're having. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up today? Well, I think I've probably, I've probably talked about enough already today. <laughs> so, so, you know, from, from, from the very, the very sad to the, to the, to the, to the joyful and to the, to the philosophical and the, the life and life and death in, in fiction, as well as in, in, in real life. So, so thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity. And, and I look forward to watching more Vista Talks myself, because I can see just how, what a great, a great range uh, you, you, you cover and, and great range of interests uh, you, you, you're allowing for and, and welcoming. Well, that, that's very kind, Anna, for you to say. It's been our absolute pleasure to have you. My mind is dying to figure out how the death in the Kilmainham jail that you wrote about took place in modern times in a locked room. So that's that's got me thinking already. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of our listeners will go and look at your works uh, so far. And uh, I, hopefully it would lead to more and more readers, uh, both now and in the future. But it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have you as a, as a guest today. You're very, very welcome. Thank you. Well, look, that's the end of today's show with Anna Husaf. Uh, Anna uh, has been a, a fabulous guest. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And please make sure that you tune in again to see and or hear uh, the next Vista Talk show, where once again, we hope to be discussing more interesting topics with interesting people from all around the world. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.